So yes, this is a case story. And it's also about, uh, it's of my husband, uh, of his final months of his life. And I refer to him as Jay in this presentation. I had his full permission to actually use his name, which is unusual in scientific uh, circles, but he actually signed the paper because he knew and he wanted me to do it. And this presentation today also includes some of my reflections, my experiences inside, which led me to a deeper understanding of what was happening. So really, our metaphysical position will condition all we think, say, and do. This is often forgotten by people, and we don't normally talk about our metaphysical positions. But depending on, on what your beliefs are, will condition of how you act. So um, here we're talking about the, the mental states of a person who was on medical drugs for ever since I met him. He had a heart condition and it started off with a pacemaker and then multiple medications. But here what I'm using is um, to, because we're talking about the mental states of a person who at the beginning could not describe his own mental states when he was returned as terminal from the hospital. So I'm using manifested behavior as an indication of what was going on inside him. And I also use photography of what was going on inside him. So in, before I it really, he went, well, before he went into hospital for the last time, I remember going into the bedroom and sort of thinking, I hope he doesn't suffer. And, and the thought just turned around on me and said, who's suffering? And I realized that it was really myself. This whole thing of looking after my husband was changing my life. And I was a meditation, I was teach meditation, I was academic, I had activities. And I suddenly realized that looking after him would involve all changes in me rather than changes in, in him. So that perception um, really changed the game for me because I decided to show up to him, for him, 100%. And with that, my suffering just dropped away because I, was, I decided that I would, would be him in this last journey of his life and I'd be fully present. So let's just go through the medical history because we're in a medical department and this is really quite interesting of uh, what happened, why it happened, and how you can come, overcome some of the manifestations of his consciousness. So he started with an insufficient heart condition over 30 years ago. He had his first pa pacemaker fitted in 1992 but he was constantly on medication for his heart and other issues like high blood pressure, um, possible thrombotic issues, and gout since 1992. But when his health really began to deteriorate was in September 2021. Uh, this was quite a big deterioration from somebody who'd always been very active, appearing at conferences, traveling, and though he still did some of that in 2021, it was in 2022 that four visits to the hospital started because we could no longer control the retention of water just with uh, pills. And in the hospital, they administered uh, fluoroamida, which is a diuretic, intravenously. And at some cases, they also gave him blood transfusions because he was, uh, his red blood count was very low. And on the fourth visit to the hospital, really in retrospect, even before he went in, I should have realized he wasn't quite the man I knew because he was really a little bit rude to the hospital staff, which was just not like my husband. But after four days in the hospital, they'd managed to get his arms and his legs the, the water out of that, but he was very swollen and he began a series, well, he 
he was diagnosed with dementia. So on the 30th of January, he was returned to me as terminal and probably needing palliative care assessment. So how do I know he had dementia? There was confusion, there was a lack of ability to write. When he came home, confusion, lack of ability of write, uh, to work on his computer. In fact, he'd completely forgotten how it worked. He was shouting and assigning imaginary aspects to the people who visited him. His eyes were wide open and there was a very startled expression. And he mainly talked with his eyes closed. He hardly slept. He would throw off his clothes and blankets and the person on duty would have to pick them up and put them on again because it was very cold. So, and as I said, he couldn't walk and support himself on his legs. So here are some photographs of him in that condition. Um, he really liked something being put on his head. He'd wear these cloths on his head and he'd assist on them most of the time. So when the medical doctor came, not from palliative, first from the emergency services, he said I could give one orphodol, which is an anti-anaxolytic, a, a day of a night, and this would calm his mental condition. And maybe I could go to two if I thought it necessary. But when the palliative doctor came a few days later, he said I could go to five. And I realized that this would turn my husband into a living vegetable. And I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. So I said to the doctor, could I have permission to take away all medications? Um, he was still on medication at that stage, directed by the hospital, and the palliative doctor agreed to this. Um, I noticed that on his right side, he was getting quite a bulge. Um, but in the hospital, they never admitted that he actually had cirrhosis of the liver. The uh, uh, doctor from the emergency services had told me he had cirrhosis. Um, and nobody confirmed in the medical field that this was probably drug-induced uh, because my husband really was not a big drinker ever in, in his life. So we took, these are the the medications he was on before the uh, beginning of February, we took the whole lot away. And on the 8th of February, I began treatment with, with plants. So we have, we have allopathic medicine, who try, which tries to reduce symptoms, but doesn't really go into the causes of things. And often with allopathic medicine, they give a medication, and then that creates a secondary effect, and then another medication was given. And this was really the story of my husband's life. And he was a medical doctor. He believed in the medical system. Um, so when I withdrew all the medication, that was the 5th of February, and these dates are quite interesting, and I went into naturopathic medicine also with the help of a naturopath. And we knew I, I took control because he'd also signed an affidavit. I could do so over all his beans. And he wasn't in a position to choose from himself. So we began this, this with treating him with plants. Um, he would never have agreed to it being a medical doctor, I assure you. So there's no, nothing that says this was a suggestion that we had this tremendous change in consciousness because it wasn't. He, he, in fact, accused me many times of poisoning him because he realized that we were putting things in his uh, drinks and his foods. So this was the introduction. In my paper, you can read the herbs we did. It was mainly to treat the liver because the liver is the easiest way to get in, to clean out the system. I, I didn't do it to save his life, but I was really wanted my husband to be conscious at his death. Um, so these were put in his food. Uh, we, 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 three times a day, we'd, we'd administer the, the correct amount. 
And we also treated him for low-grade entities. Now, that's very strange to, to people from the scientific world. But when you're really your, your, your aura is fractured, you can attract entities that also need to be treated when you're treating somebody with dementia and is in the terminal condition. So I had a team of two other people. I had a, a woman who joined the team. She was from Nicaragua, and she suggested somebody to help because, as I said, he couldn't stand by himself. And this is really how Jürgen entered my life. First of all, as somebody who would just help over the weekends. So when when it I noticed quickly noticed when he was on duty over the weekend, my husband was not quite as aggressive as he was either with me or the other female helper. And um, Jürgen worked with him a lot. He began to to look at his computer in in a way and he and Jürgen would open documents and my husband would slowly start to follow and then on the the uh, 13th of february we took him to the community services to be declared that he he actually was decapacitated and he seemed to enjoy the outing but the next day when we suggested he went he left the flat again he got very aggressive he, he he didn't want any change in his situation and he didn't contribute to, to the changes within himself at that stage. But because there was quite a lot of noise in the flats because they were doing works and although he was awake most of the night, he'd try and sleep during the day. And this began to get on, he began to not like this noise in the flat and he suggested we leave to the mountains where we have a house. And this was, we organized uh, an assisted taxi uh, three times and he pulled out on each of the three occasions. But on the fourth, we finally got him to the mountains. And we, in fact, we stopped. He, he was already much, much more lucid than those pictures you could see with the, this rag over his head. And we stopped in the village and we had lunch and the local priest joined us. And he could join in the conversation and it was really, you know, just within a month, the change of when we'd taken away all the medications was, was tremendous. And then when we arrived home, the changes became quick and rapid. He started walking with the walker again. Um, he started working on his computer. He started being interested in life. And he also started writing which was common, mainly political and social comments, which he called alligators. And he got the first one out by the, I think it was the, the 6th of um, March, but with help from Jürgen. But then after, this is and it, first his excursion to the village. He was so happy. Um, you know, if I, now he was lucid again. He wanted to go to, to mass. Uh, he wanted to see the people in the village. And I can't tell you how rewarding it was for us who were, were living this experience with him. And, and we knew it was going in one way, but that wasn't the issue. We lived every single moment as something highly, highly precious and important. Um, on the 5th of April was his birthday. And Jürgen very touchingly decorated the whole house to my surprise and his surprise. And, and we had a really memorable day. Um, as I said, he's, he began to work with his computer again. And on the 17th of March, he put out the first, fi uh, first finished work um, on an article. But then he began to write two articles that were spiritual. And one was a reflection. We were in Samana Santa. One was a reflection on the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on a donkey. And it, it's, it's a really, really touching article. And he was talking about how to enter into 
the golden gates, you have to go humbly. And this is something we all forget in life, that if we really want to get into the highest conscious spheres, we have to go humbly. Um, he also left us in this article um, with uh, a new world that announced by Jesus where God will be the, the, the strong man to not, in not only hope, but the prediction that he leaves us with in the short story that God will be on earth with us again. We will live the spirit on earth. And for, shortly following that article, he was nominated for a prize by the Brotherhood of the Guardia Seville. And he, he writes the article saying when he first received it, he, he felt, he got very excited and, and he says, vanity, vanity, vanity. And then I think with this previous article on, on humility, he suddenly reflected on himself and he toned down. But we actually got him in his wheelchair to, to the center where the prizes were going to be uh, issued. And the, first of all, they gave him his prize. He was sitting on the wheelchair below the stage. But everybody else who'd got a prize was on the stage and could talk. And then he sort of said, can I talk as well? And they tried to bring the microphone down and they couldn't. And so they said, do you want to go up on the stage? And he said, yes. And they hoisted his, uh, six sort of burly men came and hoisted him straight up onto the stage. And he gave a very moving talk. This is somebody who could not talk coherently two months beforehand. And he ended with, Long live Spain, long live the king, and long live the Guardia Seville. Well, the whole place stood up. They were amazed. His voice was strong. Physically, you could see we were dealing with a very sick man, but spiritually, you could see somebody who was growing in spirit every minute. So here's some pictures of the event, and this is one picture that I've blown up. Just look at his eyes. When, when spirit starts living through a person, you see it in the person. And he was, his body was going, but he was growing in spirit every, every single day. And people who came to our house were amazed. And just also to give you an indication of the recuperation of his consciousness, uh, three friends of mine visited, one German, one Italian, and uh, um, uh, English. And he changed, talking with each one of them in their respective languages. This is someone who in February had dementia. Right. So again, this was, this was his last visit to the village. Um, he was in very, very happy. And he also had one more event coming up. Just before the event, his vital signs went very low and the palliative doctor wanted us to start morphine. Martin didn't want it and that was respected. He got to a sicker conference like this there uh, in, in May 2023, the 4th and the 5th of May. And I thought he'd just go and give his opening address but no, he insisted in staying. And he gave the opening address and he actually clarified what the objectives of his foundation that he started is all about, the foundation sicker. And it's to contribute, uh, even if modestly, to promote the development of a more humanitarian and conscious society. In that event, he was in a wheelchair seven hours with the journey there and back. That did take its toll, and the next day there were a lot of blisters on his legs and that, but he never complained. Um, they, we tried a bit of low-dose morphine, but he began to want the light on again, so we took everything away and just increased the doses of the herbal medicines like valeriano and things that he did very well on. But then the doc, the, 
the palliative doctor appeared on the 11th of May and he went into the bedroom and he said, he took the vital signs, which were very low, and he said to my husband, are you uh, in pain? And he said, yes. But he, the palliative doctor didn't ask zero out of 10 how much pain he had. And he came out of the bedroom and both me and Jürgen were present. And he said, it's time now we give your husband a reversible injection. And I said, what? And he said, yes, he is suffering mentally because his vital signs are so low. And I said, I'm sorry, you know, that isn't the... Uh, he gave me the paper and I got it. And he said, um, and it says on the paper, if you don't sign it, if you sign it negatively, you have to get yourself a lawyer. Now, this is coercion. And it also, so I said, if I don't sign it, what happens? And he said, you're responsible for your husband's suffering. And with that, he left the house. So I went into the bedroom and I said, Jesus, how much pain have you got? So he said, hmm, probably about a four. You know, he'd been in bed. He'd been in this conference for seven hours. Um, you know, you hardly, okay. You're hardly feeling absolutely wonderful, but he didn't complain. Complain. So euthanasia these days is called mercy killing, but really there's nothing merciful about killing. Beforehand, it was called either homicide or suicide, but we seem to have sugarcoated a term that euthanasia is somewhat acceptable um, but we don't really mention what's involved. In this story, I'm not really talking about uh, suicide. I'm talking about more what would be considered homicide beforehand. And I think also in this case that the medical doctor who attended, the palliative doctor, knew very little about spiritual consciousness. Because as we grow in spiritual consciousness, we can, with our will, we can overcome most physical conditions. So my husband was a highly religious person, but he was also a highly spiritual person. But because of, he, he was singing the Regina Sally in Latin with the local priest who came every morning, and he was also receiving the host every morning. But because I'm a doctor in psychology, and even though I'm, as my subject is consciousness, I fall below a doctor. So because of the discrepancy between what I felt my husband was doing or experiencing and what the doctor said, I decided to call in another point of view and I called in Kizos Poveda, who came to our house and he, this was on the Sunday on the 14th, and he, which incidentally he'd had chocolate and churros for breakfast, uh, which was his favorite breakfast, and he looked at my husband, he addressed him, he talked to him, and he said, your husband is not suffering, he's dying. But there's a great difference between suffering and dying. So on the Monday after Jesus Poveda had seen him, he sang the Regina Sally one last time with the priest. And by midday, uh, he stopped talking. But before he did, he said, tomorrow I go. And um, we waited all day the next day, and it was only when I eventually I left the room early on the Wednesday morning that he left. I think the pull to me was too great, and he waited. I thank you for listening to this. I'm very honored. I accompanied my husband he completed his journey academically, humanitarian, and spiritual. What more can you ask from, from someone in life? Dignity is about doing it right. Dignity is not about dying all the same. Dignity is showing up to life and doing things for people in a dignified way. It's, it's hierarchical. We are all the spark of God, but we don't all live our life in a way that we take the best advantage of it. So if anything you take home from this, this study, 
or this sharing is that live your life to your fill, serve people, serve humanity, serve God. And also I found a recent study for the medical people present that elderly people taking at least five medications are increased risk of cognitive impairment and dementia. So please, the medical profession, have consideration with the elder population who are on so many drugs. This can be a, mainly the cause of the dementia that is happiness. And just to insight, our happiness depends on others being happy. And for me, this includes looking after the weak, the ages, and infirm. The question if, if euthanasia is really based on the concern for the patient's well-being, or if they acknowledge perceived suffering of the family member plays a role in their choice, or it has become a convenient policy. The day that I had a break for understanding when asking who suffered changed my attitude to life. It helped me to show up for my husband and live every moment we spent together as a sacred gift. For those people who are contemplating signing a form, giving a medical practitioner the right to inject an irreversible doses of morphine or other substance, ask themselves, can you do it yourself? Can you take that injection and inject it into your loved one? And if you can't, don't expect someone to do it for you. And as a medical profession, pro professionals, I ask you, what has this got to do with the Hippocratic Oath where you promised to first do no harm? Natural death is a portal which has its own perfect timing. And I thank you once again. And thank you, you. Dr. Tina. <laughs>